The UN administration's latest top-level diplomatic engagements in Central Asia have led to significant pledges of partnerships in energy, infrastructure and transport. These include cooperation on a gas processing facility in Turkmenistan, a smart city infrastructure in Kazakhstan and the export of high-speed rail technology to Uzbekistan. Meanwhile, for South Korea, parties highlight the sealing of critical minerals deals as major achievements. Hello and welcome. It's Monday, June 17th here in Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. Today, we touch upon President Sogyal's Central Asia tour and its accomplishments with our panel of foreign journalists. I have Chloe, a correspondent for News Channel France 24 here in the studio. Chloe, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. I also have Matthew, a freelance journalist based here in Sa South Korea, with us as well. Matthew, welcome. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Right, Matthew, let's begin with details about the partnership pledged between South Korea and Turkmenistan during President Sogyal's Central Asia tour last week. Okay, yeah. Um, he, uh, President Yoon visited uh, several countries in Central Asia. And uh, Tur in Turkmenistan, he met with uh, leaders there. And he said in a speech that... Uh, the industrial expertise and technology of Korea can be combined with Turkmenistan's natural resources and that there can be economic synergy between them. Uh, Turkmenistan is said to have a lot of unmined natural resources, especially resources that are uh, important for the development of semiconductors and uh, electric vehicle batteries like lithium. And also Turkmenistan is, is said to be the world's fourth largest holder of natural gas. So it has a lot of untapped resources there that uh, President Yoon said that Korea could join into agreements with the country to help them more utilize their resources more effectively. Right. And staying with resources, Chloe, President Yoon Yeol's second stop in Central Asia was Kazakhstan. And his sealing of deals on critical minerals received quite a bit of foreign media attention. Do tell us more about that. Yes, yeah, so the deal that was reached was that it allows Korean firms to explore for a specific mineral, so lithium, uh, that is a key element for the battery, uh, electric batteries, as we just said, but also chrome, uranium, and any rare earth material that uh, Korea would need. And uh, it's a kind of direction that South Korea is taking with all the deals as well. In the few weeks ago in the Korea-Africa summit, uh, same kind of deals was reached with Ethiopia and with Tanzania. Uh, so why is South Korea trying to develop this kind of, um, you know, this kind of deals and why is it uh, attracting foreign media attention is that uh, South Korea is trying to diversify its supply chains on rare materials there. Um, because it's the country of semiconductor producers. It's also uh, the country of the world's fifth largest automaker, uh, that is Hyundai. And with uh, the development of Green Deal transition, uh, the need for all electrical battery and for semiconductors for the new technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence is rising up. Just to give you a few ideas, uh, government data from February is saying that South Korea is currently importing about 95% of all the major uh, elements, minerals that it needs to produce all those batteries and these uh, semiconductors. And by 2040, the demand for lithium, so the one for the electrical batteries, will be, is expected to be 42 times that of 2020. For cobalt will be 21 times, for nickel will be 19 times. So that's showing the strategical position that is needed to be diversifying this uh, production, not production, sorry, the import of these elements to not depend on one country because currently uh, South Korea is mostly depending on China. So that's why they're trying to develop that and that's also why the world, the world is having their eyes on it because uh, the government so listed uh, 10 strategic key minerals to be searched for and um, to get a stable supply that is crucial in a country that's lacking these natural resources. And it's also linked to the US Inflation Act or uh, Inflation Reduction Act, sorry, because uh, the United States is now stating that to be able to sell uh, electrical batteries, they need to have a certain amount of uh, part of uh, rare materials that were mined or processed in the US or in a country with free trade pacts uh, with the US, which is uh, not the case for most of the 
minerals that are known for the moment arriving in South Korea. So the government has been quite clear in the beginning of the year. The objective is to reduce dependence on key minerals from specific nations from the current 80% of the imports to around 50% by 2030. And that's why they are doing here as well in Central Asia. Right, indeed. And moving forward, Matthew, the President's final destination was Uzbekistan. What were some of your main takeaways from the summit there? Well, one of the big ones was that uh, uh, Hyundai Rotoms has a deal now to supply high-speed trains to the country, to Uzbekistan. So uh, the KTX has been an important part of Korea's achievements and economy, and they not only, you may remember when it was created, it was built a long time ago. One of the stipulations was that not only were they did, did they want to create this high-speed rail line in South Korea, but they wanted to uh, know all the technology involved so that they can then further export it to other countries. So this is part of one of this is one of the uh, long-term plans that uh, Korean industry, where they can not only get technology from other countries, but then further export them to uh, third parties. So that's a good uh, that's a good accomplishment for Korea in general, for Team Korea in general, and you know for Hyundai Rotem in particular. And they also talked; they said a lot of similar things compared to what they talked about in the other two countries. That a lot of natural resources can be utilized by Korea for a mutual benefit between the two countries. And uh, they also mentioned a lot of uh, technological capabilities like digitalization and. Uh, uh, digital government, things that uh, Korea f thinks that it has uh, expertise in and they would like to uh, export to other countries. Mm -hmm. So they did talk about that in Turkmenistan. Also the, the Uzbek president said that he will support any projects of South Korean businesses within his country. Right. So it was a very generous response. Right, right. Uh, and Chloe, against this backdrop, come next year, Korea is hoping to host a summit with Central Asia, including all five countries there. What do you believe are the broader implications of the scheduled summit between South Korea and Central Asia for next year? So it's uh, interesting to see that South Korea is offering that now. Uh, when we look at the geopolitical dynamics in the area, uh, Central Asia has been seen for a long time as uh, a place uh, that was a strong influence from Russia. So it's the ex uh, diploma uh, sovietic um, bloc and uh, there is like strong influence from Russia that is also one of the strongest partner, economical partner in the area. But at the moment we can see that uh, Russia is putting less influence in the area because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, so Central Asia is now seen as one of the big place of disputes between the global big, um, you know, the powerful nation like US, China, so Russia is still here. Uh, European nation is also trying to come in. Uh, so there is an opportunity for South Korea here. That is, uh, they are playing on a different level. They are seen um, more like economical partners and they are seen as less imposed on by the population because they are playing a more a subtle game here in a diplomatic stance. Uh, also, China is still particularly active with the new Silk Road, and we can see that Korea is trying to develop its own K Silk Road, uh, that is, uh, to develop relationship in the area where there is a strong Korean diaspora. And so that's what was kind of dealt with everyone. Uh, as we say, the high-speed train, the smart city is a kind of way to develop the position of South Korea here. And obviously, the area has a strong economical development potential because it's a, as a young, dynamic demographic structure, growth is possible there. So um, there was deals made on energy, technology, manufacturing. So that's one of the broader implications there, is that Korea is playing a like, long-term game in the area. Right. And, and Chloe, beyond South Korea, France, I believe, has been courting Central Asia as well with French President Emmanuel Macron making a visit there. What more can you tell us? Yeah, so he came in uh, November, so Emmanuel Macron went to Kazakhstan and to Uzbekistan. It's interesting to note that since the downfall of the Soviet bloc, Soviet blocs, uh, he's the first French president in 30 years who came. So it's been 30 years in Uzbekistan that no president, French president, sorry, came in. Uh, why France decided to 
kind of go on with this diplomatic uh, visit is there's a few reasons. First of all, a bit like South Korea, it's important to play into other secondary actor role and diplomatic here in the area to make sure that uh, it's not only uh, control kind of, but um, under the, the influence of only one nation. Uh, there is still a point here that it's, it's going to be hard for France by itself to be developing alone the diplomatic game here. Uh, that's why they also have to count on the European Union. That is a strong player as well in the area. Uh, second thing is uh, France need to diversify its source of energy and currently 60, more than 60% of French energy uh, mix is made by nuclear uh, power. So uh, Kazakhstan is the world's largest producer of uranium. It's the first uh, like importation in France all from uh, Kazakhstan first. And in Uzbekistan, one of the uranium mines is owned by uh, Orano, that is uh, the French nuclear company that is you know, having most of the nuclear power plant in France. Uh, and then they also have as South Korea, the question of securing critical minerals for the green transition energy. France is not as strong of uh, building up uh, electrical batteries or anything, but it's important for the future to be able to secure as well some uh, import from there. And last thing is economical relationship. It's interesting to know that France is the fifth biggest investor in Kazakhstan before China. Uh, that's mostly because uh, the French energy giant Total Energy is uh, you know, putting a lot of money in the offshore oil field project. And uh, in the near future, uh, EDF, that is the state-owned electricity company, could be building an EPR type nuclear plant, uh, reactor, sorry, a nuclear reactor in the area in, uh, it depends, the referendum is still to be done in the country, but France has a big game here in economical states uh, in the area. So that's part of the reasons France is courting Central Asia. Right, I see. Meanwhile, back here in South Korea, Matthew, the envisioned Korea Central Asia Summit for next year follows mm -hmm. the Korea Africa Summit this year, as Chloe mentioned earlier, and last year's Korea Pacific Islands Summit. Do remind us a bit about last year's diplomatic endeavor. Yeah, um, the uh, Korea Pacific Islands Summit last year was the first of its, of its kind. It was held here in Seoul and uh, a lot of different nations from the Pacific Islands, the ones that you know sound especially exotic that you might have heard of, showed up here in Seoul to, to uh, go to the summit. It was the, uh, it was foc the focus of the summit was discussing climate change and disaster risk and resilience because a lot of those countries are, m are more closely affected by uh, rising sea levels due to climate change than larger countries like, uh, like Korea itself. There was also a lot of talk about sustainable development and uh, maritime affairs and fisheries, which are of course very relevant to countries that are completely surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. And uh, Korea offered uh, uh, what is becoming now a familiar pitch to those countries that they offered to share with them uh, digital cooperation development of their broadband access and uh, other infrastructure like that because that's the strength that Korea has had for a very long time now. And they, it's more difficult to create those kind of links to countries that are simply small islands in the Pacific. So uh, Korea extended a lot of uh, offers for help in that area and they also said that they would increase the number of embassies in the Indo-Pacific region so that uh, South Korea and those countries could have a much stronger development. So um, also they also talked about the uh, idea of a link to digital platform government. I don't know if when was the last time you went to your local, uh, local district office, but it's often very smooth and easy to do bureaucratic things in Korea compared to my own country where everything, a lot of things are still on paper and uh, you gotta get stamps and I just, I was home a few months ago and I had to uh, take care of some things related to my state government. It was a very frustrating process. Right. But uh, c comparatively, if you want to like register a car or buy a house or something in Korea, the bureaucratic part related to the, the government is uh, very smooth. So right. I, Korea has been for many years uh, offering to export that kind of technology that they've developed to other countries and they extended that offer to 
to the Pacific Islands, and uh, hopefully that they will be able to take them up on that. And uh, this is all part of the uh, study and a strategy that was published by the Korean government in December 2022. So they had a strategy that they need to extend their their reach and their influence into many different areas. Central Asia was one of them, Africa was another one, but uh, the Indo-Pacific was a third. And they would like to, I guess, uh, you wouldn't want to say supplant, but also offer a, another alternative to countries that have traditionally been had to choose between the United States and China for uh, whatever technological or resource development they'd like to undertake. So uh, it was, it was, it's a new thing for Korea. It's, it's only been a couple, couple years that they've been trying to do this, but uh, it's, uh, it's a promising initiative. Right, and, and staying with what uh, Matthew has just said, Chloe, do you see these d diplomatic endeavors by the Yun Sa Gyal administration as taking it a step closer, perhaps, to its quest of becoming a global pivotal state? Yeah, so it's just, you know, South Korea wants to come and become a global polit uh, political, diplomatical uh, pivot now. Uh, so under the Yun Sa Gyal administration, we've seen that first with the fact that it pulled a bit more, uh, more away from North Korea questions and more towards uh, United States and Japan for the trilateral alliance. So that was the first part of you know, growing up diplomatically. Uh, and it's now going more global. You just say like the Pacific African nations and now uh, Central Asia we just talked about. And when you look, for example, at the Korean Africa summit that just happened a few weeks ago, um, I was there for France 24. And when speaking with delegation and leaders, uh, what you can see is that they are pleased with the approach of South Korea. So as Mathieu just said, there is this thing of offering a bit of uh, knowledge on their technology that South Korea is excelling at, uh, digital uh, administration, but there's also an approach of that was clearly stated for uh, the African summit, uh, Korea-Africa summit, was no history of colonization or subjugation between the two countries. And this is part of uh, the position that Korea, South Korea is currently, you know, getting up to. And um, it's, it's what is the strong strength of South Korea. But in my opinion, just as I said about France in Central Asia, uh, it's hard to be a pivot state in so many uh, geographical area with so many different, uh, you know, problematics by yourself. So especially when you're a country the size of South Korea or France compared to China, Russia, in the United States, and that could be uh, the drawbacks for South Korea plan to become more a global pivot state. Right, definitely room for improvement in that area then. And Matthew, speaking of that, what is your assessment of the Korean government's efforts thus far to play a greater role on the international stage? Well, I, I feel that uh, Korea always has a difficult path, a delicate, thin path to tread between uh, the interests of greater powers around it and its own self-interest. You know, uh, Korea is geographically and politically and in, culturally pretty much in between China and the US. So it's got a very long and storied trade partnership with China going back literally thousands of years. And it also in modern times, it has an extremely close and uh, uh, lucrative trade partnership with the United States. And recently the United States has been changing its policy to more uh, freeze out China and China re related countries in order to uh, pursue its own global agenda. But that global agenda for what works for the United States doesn't always work for South Korea exactly. So they have to find some third, third path or third way where they can, where this country can do what's best for its people and its own self-interest. And I think that uh, reaching out to these these new areas, these countries, is one possible way where it can go. Uh, Korea does have a lot to offer, and the things that were discussed in uh, all of these all of these conferences that we've been talking about are really diverse. We have energy, we have infrastructure, uh, industry, engineering, trade, transport, logistics, digitization, aerospace, finance, education, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, tourism, culture all sorts of stuff that Korea has been focusing on and developing for themselves and that they, they are 
and can now uh, uh, export to other countries. So for some countries, uh, more th some things are more relevant, and for other countries, different things are irrelevant. You know, like the Pacific Islands are not going to be full of natural resources that can be mined and exported to Korea. But then again, the, uh, the uh, Central Asian countries are not going to have a lot of fishery resources that Korea is familiar with. But Korea can tailor its offerings to each area to get a lot of mutual benefit. And I think that this is a good effort in doing that and finding some way to do what's best for the Korean government and the Korean people. Right, indeed. All right, Matthew, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Chloe, thank you very much for your insights today. Thank you. Right, well, that ends Monday's edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow. Thank you.